all you here who live beside the home of Amphion and Cadmus. In human life there's no set place which I would praise or blame. The lucky and unlucky rise or fall by chance day after day. And how these things are fixed for men no one can prophesy. For Creon, in my view, was once a man we all looked up to. For he saved the state, this land of Cadmus, from its enemies. He took control and reigned as its sole king, and prospered with the birth of noble children. Now all is gone. For when a man has lost what gives him pleasure, I don't include him among the living. He's a breathing corpse. Pile up a massive fortune in your home, if that's what you want. Live like a king. If there's no pleasure in it, I'd not give to any man a vapor's shadow for it, not compared to human joy. Have you come with news of some fresh trouble in our house of kings? They're dead, and those alive bear the responsibility for those who've died. Who did the killing? Who's lying dead? Tell us. Haman has been killed. No stranger shed his blood. At his father's hand, or did he kill himself? By his own hand, angry at his father for the murder. Tiresias, how your words have proven true. That's how things stand. Consider what comes next. I see Creon's wife, poor Eurydice. She's coming from the house, either by chance, or else she's heard there's news about her son. Enter Eurydice from the palace with some attendants. Citizens of Thebes, I heard you talking, as I was walking out, going off to pray, to ask for help from Goddess Pallas. While I was unfastening the gate, I heard someone speaking of bad news about my family. I was terrified. I collapsed, fainting back into the arms of my attendants. So tell the news again. I'll listen. I'm no stranger to misfortune. Dear lady, I'll speak of what I saw, omitting not one detail of the truth. Why should I ease your mind with a report which turns out later to be incorrect? The truth is always best. I went to the plain, accompanying your husband as his guide. Polynices' corpse, still unlamented, was lying there, the greatest distance off, torn apart by dogs. We prayed to Pluto and to Hecate, goddess of the road, for their good will and to restrain their rage. We gave the corpse a ritual wash and burned what was left of it on fresh-cut branches. We piled up a high tomb of his native earth. Then we moved to the young girl's rocky cave, the hollow cavern of that bride of death. From far away, one man heard a voice coming from the chamber, where we'd put her without a funeral. A piercing cry. He went to tell our master Creon, who, as he approached the place, heard the sound, an unintelligible scream of sorrow. He groaned, and then spoke out these bitter words. Has misery made me a prophet now? And am I traveling along a road that takes me to the worst of all disasters? I've just heard the voice of my own son, you servants, go ahead, get up there fast. Remove the stones piled in the entranceway, then stand beside the tomb and look in there to see if that was Haman's voice I heard, or if the gods have been deceiving me. Following what our desperate master asked, we looked. In the furthest corner of the tomb we saw Antigone hanging by the neck, held up in a noose, fine woven linen. Haman had his arms around her waist, he was embracing her and crying out in sorrow for the loss of his own bride, now among the dead, his father's work, and for his horrifying marriage bed. Creon saw him, let out a fearful groan, then went inside and called out anxiously, You unhappy boy, what have you done? What are you thinking? Have you lost your mind? Come out, my child, I'm begging you, please come. But the boy just stared at him with savage eyes, spat in his face and without saying a word, drew his two-edged sword. Creon moved away, so the boy's blow failed to strike his father. Angry at himself, the ill-fated lad right then and there leaned onto his own sword, driving half the blade between his ribs. While still conscious, he embraced the girl in his weak arms, and, as he breathed his last, he coughed up streams of blood on her fair cheek. Now he lies there, corpse on corpse, his marriage has been fulfilled in chambers of the dead. The unfortunate boy has shown all men how, of all the evils which afflict mankind, the most disastrous one is thoughtlessness. 
Eurydice turns and slowly returns into the palace. What do you make of that? The queen's gone back. She left without a word, good or bad. I'm surprised myself. It's about her son. She heard that terrible report. I hope she's gone because she doesn't think it right to mourn for him in public. In the home, surrounded by her servants, she'll arrange a period of mourning for the house. She's discreet and has experience. She won't make mistakes. I'm not sure of that. To me, her staying silent was extreme. It seems to point to something ominous, just like a vain excess of grief. I'll go in. We'll find out if she's hiding something secret deep within her passionate heart. You're right. Excessive silence can be dangerous. The messenger goes up the stairs into the palace. Enter Creon from the side, with attendants. Creon is holding the body of Haman. Here comes the king in person, carrying in his arms, if it's right to speak of this, a clear reminder that this evil comes not from some stranger, but his own mistakes. Ay, mistakes made by a foolish mind, cruel mistakes that bring on death. You see us here, all in one family, the killer and the killed. Oh, the profanity of what I planned. Alas, my son, you died so young, a death before your time. I, I, you're dead, gone, not your own foolishness. But mine. Alas, it seems you've learned to see what's right, but far too late. I, I've learned it in my pain. Some god clutching a great weight struck my head, then hurled me onto paths in wilderness, throwing down and casting underfoot what brought me joy. So sad, so sad. The wretched agony of human life. The messenger reappears from the palace. My lord, you come like one who stores up evil, what you hold in your arms and what you'll see before too long inside the house. What's that? Is there something still more evil than all this? Your wife is dead, blood mother of that corpse, slaughtered with a sword. Her wounds are very new, poor lady. I, a gathering place for death. No sacrifice can bring this to an end. Why are you destroying me? You there, you bringer of this dreadful news, this agony. What are you saying now? I, you kill a man, then kill him once again. What are you saying, boy? What news? A slaughter heaped on slaughter. My wife, alas, she's dead? Opening the palace doors, revealing the body of Eurydice. Look here. No longer is she concealed inside. Alas, how miserable I feel to look upon this second horror. What remains for me? What's fate still got in store? I've just held my own son in my arms, and now I see right here in front of me another corpse. Alas for this suffering mother. Alas, my son, stabbed with a sharp sword at the altar, she let her darkening eyesight fail. Once she had cried out in sorrow for the glorious fate of Megarios, who died some time ago, and then again for Haman. And then, with her last breath, she called out evil things against you, the killer of your sons. I, my fear now makes me tremble. Why won't someone now strike out at me, pierce my heart with a double-bladed sword? How miserable I am! I... How full of misery and pain! By this woman who lies dead you stand charged with the deaths of both your sons. What about her? How did she die so violently? She killed herself. With her own hands she stabbed her belly when she heard her son's unhappy fate. Alas for me! The guilt for all of this is mine. It can never be removed from me or passed to any other mortal man. I and I alone... I murdered you. I speak the truth. Servants, hurry and lead me off. Get me away from here. For now what I am in life is nothing. What you advise is good, if good can come with all these evils. When we face such things, the less we say, the better. 
Let that day come, oh, let it come, the fairest of all destinies for me, the one which brings on my last day. Oh, let it come, so that I never see another dawn. That's something for the times ahead. Now we need to deal with what confronts us here. What's yet to come is the concern of those whose task it is to deal with it. In that prayer, I included everything I most desire. Pray for nothing. There's no release for mortal human beings, not from events which destiny has set. Then take this foolish man away from here. I killed you, my son, without intending to, and you as well, my wife. How useless I am now. I don't know where to look or find support. Everything I touch goes wrong, and on my head fate climbs up with its overwhelming load. The attendants help Creon move up the stairs into the palace, taking Haman's body with them. The most important part of true success is wisdom, not to act impiously towards the gods, for boasts of arrogant men bring on great blows of punishment. So in old age, men can discover wisdom. Wisdom.